Lani, are you are you there? Okay, show your face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to serve you. Even if you think it's too remedial, or even if you think I wouldn't like the question, don't worry about that. Ask me anything at all. I'm I'm here to serve. I think Lani. Uh, <laughs> Okay, I was looking at my questions earlier and I realized that most of these were already addressed, I mean, from your introduction. But uh, while you were speaking, I was just thinking about, is it safe to say that it is all part of this creative contextualization, if you will, this contextualization of God? Because in that fashion, he is able to make us understand his point from the creation to the gradual unfolding of, of his redemptive plan. Is it a, a, a safe way to say God's context, contextualization? Also related to the incarnation of Christ, the term con condescension, is it related with the term contextualization? Well, that is such a loaded question, Lonnie. There are, um, there is like, um, hundreds and thousands of pages written on what contextualization is. Um, the Reformed tradition has a term called accommodation. Yeah. That's that's okay. the that's the old fashioned Reformed term for it. And here's what it is. This is part of the mystery. God speaks when God condescends to it. I'm going to try to answer. Tell me if I get your, if this helps, Lonnie. If it doesn't help, you won't hurt my feelings and say, Lane, that doesn't help at all. Um, it, it's You've missed my question. You won't hurt my feelings at all because I'm here to serve you. And I, I, I'll i only be happy when I've served you well. Um, but in, in condescension, the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God speaks to us in finite, temporal, and changeable idiom. He speaks to us in language that he creates, language that he implants inside of us. We have the capacity for language built into us uh, as, a, as a creation from God. And he borrows from that and speaks to us. Um, without himself being finite, he speaks to finite creatures. Without himself being mutable, he speaks to mutable creatures. Without himself being temporal, he speaks to temporal creatures in an idiom and in a context that he has created. And the mystery is that when he does this, he reveals himself truly to us without himself losing himself, without becoming something other than what he is. Um, in the essay that I sent you guys, which you're free to read, I say God enters into every moment of time without becoming temporal, occupies every square inch of space without becoming spatial, and relates to every mutable creature without becoming mutable. And and so when you're you're say when you're talking about contextualization, the key is that God's accommodation, the way he lisps to us, the way he speaks to us in our language and idioms, and the way he enters into our space and time, that is what I call macro contextualization. That's macro. That is the big picture of contextualization. And then after that, God himself becomes the all-conditioning context for the creature. Uh, he himself is the all-conditioning context. So whether you live in China, India, United States, Russia, and whether it's um, 500 years ago or today, or whether it's right after the fall or whether it's before the fall, the ultimate context for all creatures is the condescension of God as infinite, eternal, and changeable in the, cha in the finite, changeable, and mutable forms of the creation. And he speaks with absolute clarity and authority uh, to his creatures in that way. Once you get that, okay, and I've given you this, I'm glad this is all recorded because you can go back and listen to it. But once you get that, Lonnie, then... You can see a lot of mischief 
in contemporary discussions about contextualization, because for, for many on the question of contextualization, the, the question is, um, are cultural norms the absolute by which we understand and, and uh, conceive of God? Uh, the liberal theological tradition, for instance, uh, beginning with Schleiermacher and others, they don't have a doctrine a meaningful doctrine of an infinite, eternal, and unchangeable God condescending in accommodated form to speak to the creature. They conceive of the world, uh, of God in the world in, as one, uh, in, in sharing one mode, one macro creaturely mode. And then all um, contextualization is, is a shifting, changing hodgepodge of cultural constructions. Uh, with no transcendent authority, no divine revelation, just, you know, evolving cultural expressions of religion. That leads to pluralism. It leads to relativism. It leads to the end of God speaking authoritatively in his word. It, and it presupposes that God is not infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his condescension and in his accommodation and revelation of himself. So so that's a huge topic. And what I just tried to give you, Lonnie, is kind of like a reformed theological background to critique all that mischief, because there's a lot of mischief out there when it comes to contextualization. Yes, thank you. That's very helpful. But um, when we talk about the concept of accommodation, I am reminded of the communicable attributes of God, like God is faithful, God is kind. I'm just a bit uh, confused because sometimes we we basically put ourselves uh, in a position like we are faithful because God is faithful, right? How about this? I've got, I think I know where you're going. If God's attributes are communicable, mm -hmm. then isn't there a sense in which there's there's that human attributes and God's communicable attributes are uh, share the same mode. So, so that if God is faithful and we're faithful, then there's one shared category of faithfulness mm -hmm. and God participates in it and the creature participates in it. If there's mm -hmm. one category of love, God participates in it, the creature participates in it. Mm -hmm. If there's a category of wisdom, God participates in it, the creature participates in it. And that point of participation in the communicable attributes means that we can predicate of God and the creature the same kind of love, the same kind of wisdom, the same kind of knowledge, the same kind of holiness. Uh, and, and so your question might be, I'm trying to make it as strong as I can, do, incommunicable attributes, you say, I understand, but those communicable attributes, that sounds like there's a third thing that, that, that there's, a, there's a, a love and a goodness and a wisdom and a truth that both God and the creature participate in mm -hmm. because it's communicated to the creature. Does that sound, is that kind mm -hmm. of what you're thinking or am I making it too strong? Yeah, I was thinking in accommodation, it's, it's like God is adjusting to our language. But with the communicable attributes, we are made to be like him. Like, because God is faithful, we are faithful. But with accommodation... Yeah, so yeah. That is a great way of stating the thesis in this book. You've understood this book right here. That is mm -hmm. the that is the argument in this book. And, um, and there are other people, like, um, there, there are other people... Um, Lonnie, who have taught this. Um, the Socinians of the 16th century taught this. The open theists of the 20th and 21st century taught this. Um, Jürgen Moltmann, a crucified God, taught this. Process theists, uh, Charles Hartshorn and Cobb, taught this. Mm -hmm. And a whole host of others now in the 21st century teach this. So you're you're expressing a view that a bunch of people hold to. It and it's called there, there are two ways to, to, to describe it: mutualism 
or correlativism. The idea that God and man share in this in a in a common history and time god and man share common emotions god and man share common suffering god and man share common ignorance um mm -hmm. so that so that there's this mystical point where god and man touch and are mm -hmm. identical at the point they touch so you see my fingers wherever they touch feeling emotion suffering uh, pain sorrow wherever they touch they're identical or the the technical term is univocal now let me tell you what's so wrong with that um when you go back to the image of god the image and likeness of god do you remember earlier when i said god is infinite eternal and unchangeable in his life the creature is um finite temporal and changeable in his life okay when you go back to Adam, created as the image and likeness of God, um, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 10, says that he was created in true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Now, those are three categories that can be understood in terms of an analogy to God's so-called communicable attributes. But let's do a test case on the first one, just to make this really clear. God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and formed him in his image. And one of the gifts he gave him was knowledge. Now, when, when the Bible talks about the knowledge that Adam has, what does it say about his knowledge? It's finite. It's temporal. And it's mutable. He's learning things left and right. He's got to learn what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is in distinction from the tree of life. He's got to name all the animals. He doesn't know their names until he gives them to him. Uh, he's got to um, guard and tend the Garden of Eden. So he's got to walk around its perimeter and look around and see, hey, are there any serpents out there trying to get in here and profane this holy realm? So his knowledge is characterized by what? It's finite, it's temporal, and it's mutable. Knowledge is. Um, in this essay that I gave you guys that you can read later, Herman Bovink lists about 50 scriptures that say of God that his understanding, Psalm 145, is infinite. Um, Romans 11, 33 through 36, oh, the depth of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. His paths are beyond finding out. He knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. No one can hide from him. Jesus on earth, according to his human nature, knew the thoughts of all men. John 2, 25, so that the knowledge of God is, is a knowledge by which he knows, and here's the key, all things perfectly in an eternal act of intuition. Everything is known to God. We call this the doctrine of omniscience. So how do you relate the, the knowledge of God to the knowledge of Adam? analogically, not univocally. So if you do talk about so-called communicable attributes, this in this case, knowledge, the relation is not univocal or literal. This book says it's univocal and literal. This is wrong. But, but the relation is instead anthropomorphic and analogical. God knows. But he knows in accordance with his infinite, eternal, and unchangeable nature. Adam knows, but he knows in accordance with his finite, temporal, and mutable nature. So the relationship is an analogical relationship, and the predications we make of God's knowledge from the creature are anthropomorphic and not univocal, not literal. So so the um the the so-called um attributes uh communicable attributes of god um have to be understood as just that 
attributes of God, not the creature. And and also in this volume uh, and in other volumes, I could look, I could get other people. I could pull um, Carl Bart. Carl Bart does it too. I'm, I'm just illustrating this because this confuses many more people. But Carl Bart in his Church Dogmatics, he says the same sorts of things. But um, the reason we, we have to, to appreciate this is every view that we call mutualism or correlativism, every single one of them is going to say that God and man come together and share in limitation, in ignorance, and in development. And, and Lonnie, I'm so glad you raised this because a lot of people try to make communicable attributes into those third things, something God and man share in together. But the relationship is not a univocal sharing, but an analogical relation given creation, where the creator retains his distinct attributes in his knowledge, and the creature retains his distinct attributes in knowledge, and the, therefore the communicable attributes are analogically conceived. Does that prove useful? Is that helpful? Yes, that's very helpful. So it's analogically conceived, but it's also um, related to one of my questions, and I think it's also answered like, uh, it says, if Vantel mentions that there's no point of a relativity or mutual sharing in being and knowledge between the creator and creations. How do we not miss the point of God's imminence? Is there a danger in stressing too much on the transcendence of God when reckoning with the correlativism or mutualism? That's, that's a wonderful question. Here's the difference between classical reform theology and mutualism. All, all agree that God is transcendent. Everyone, before God relates to the world, even Socinians, even Scott Oliphant says he's infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Even Karl Barth says that. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's zero debate on whether or not God, before he relates to creation, is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Everyone grants that. Even heretics will grant that, like Karl Barth. Um, but here's the issue. The, here's where the debate rests. When God relates to the creation, does he remain the transcendent, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable one, or does he change? Mm -hmm. do, in, in other words, is eminence a divine change? Does God change so that when he relates to the creature, he's no longer omniscient, but ignorant. He's no longer eternal, but temporal. He's no longer immutable, but mutable. The, the, the debate between the traditional, classically reformed on the one side and the, the, the mutualists and um, the Socinians and the Biblicists on the other side is the, and, and tell me if this makes sense, Lonnie, is the nature of divine eminence. Is God in his relation to creation the immutable, eternal, and infinite God? Or is God in his eminent relation to creation a finite, dependent, mutable, ignorant, evolving deity? That's where the debate is. And, um, and, and I think that the, um, I, and I, I read something was Dr. Poitras, he's a dear friend of mine, and he's not a mutualist. He doesn't agree with this book, by the way. But in this book, The Mystery of the Trinity, he doesn't do a good job on that in the appendices. He makes it sound like the uh, classical tradition emphasizes transcendence. The mutualists and the, um, the personalists, he uses that language, they, they emphasize eminence. That's not right. He, 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 he actually knows better. He's trying to be very pastoral uh, and, and would, would say it differently if you talk to him. But the, the issue isn't a difference of, well, the classical emphasize transcendence, the mutualists emphasize eminence. The debate is what kind of eminence is conceived? Is it an eminent God who loses his transcendence in his eminence? Is it, a tra is it an eminent God who is no longer infinite, eternal, and unchangeable? Or is God in his eminence still 
the infinite, eternal, unchangeable, self-contained, simple triune God. Van Til, Bavink, and the others will always maintain that the eminent God is the transcendent God without modification. Um, so and, and so that's the that that's the 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 point for debate. That's where the lines are drawn. Mm -hmm. And um it, it's just that I think in the evangelical world, I'll just say this real quickly, and then I and Roger here in about five minutes, I'm gonna have to go. Okay. But um but in um the evangelical world out there, that big broad evangelical world that's out there, these issues are not well understood. But in our Reformed theological tradition, these issues have been clearly defined. And, um, and so it takes time to kind of settle into it and understand it. And here's why. In, 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 at least in the United States, and the United States is a mess. Uh, it's just a mess uh, in, in so many ways, theologically, politically, economic. It's just a mess. But in the Western tradition, and in the 20th century in the United States, the, the debates have turned on the deity of Christ, no, pardon me, on the work of Christ, on the nature of the Bible, on um, salvation applied, on eschatology, you know, dispensationalism, amillennialism, postmillennialism, whatever, covenant theology. There has been a significant neglect in the past hundred 150 years in the doctrine of God. And because there's been such a neglect of that, all kinds of mischief has arisen. Mischief in the form of Karl Barth, Schleiermacher, process theism, open theism, this God with us thesis. John Frame says the same thing in his, his systematic theology. And so this is tough because we're a little bit behind the curve on addressing these doctrine of God issues, but brothers and sisters, let me tell you, let me encourage you with this. Don't get frustrated. Keep thinking about this because once you see some of these foundational things that I'm giving you, these issues are resolved like that. This, this isn't a, this is a crisis for the evangelical world and, and, but it's not a crisis for the reformed we just have to make sure that those who, in the name of Reformed theology, are trying to promote these non-Reformed doctrines, that they're exposed in love, in gentleness, but but with with forcefulness, because the 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 bottom line, and I'll have to leave you, brothers and sisters, with this. And Roger, we can reschedule. We okay. can schedule another time sometime. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, definitely. Um, but um, I'll leave you with this: the the big issue here is that. If you worship a mutable, finite, ignorant God, you are not worshiping the God of Scripture. Malachi 3.6, I, the Lord, do not change covenantally in my relation to you. For that reason, you're not consumed. James 1.17, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights, who in his acts in history does not change like shifting shadows. So this is a really important issue for your worship. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, just remember that it might sound all theoretical and it might sound kind of abstract, but its payoff is that we worship the immutable living triune God in union with his son who does not confuse or confound or merge the divine and human natures at any point. Um, it's 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 a beautiful thing once you see it um now let me talk about uh, anthropomorphism uh this this is an an important uh, discussion uh for the reformed uh theological tradition uh and i want to do my best to give you an understanding of what anthropomorphism is designed to communicate. Why is it so important to speak anthropomorphically? Here, here's why. God in his being is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. Uh, when you, uh, the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question and answer four, says those things about God as spirit. He is infinite eternal and unchangeable. 
Now, he is that all the time. He He's that without modification. He is that without alteration. The creature, in yeah. contrast, is not infinite, but finite. Not eternal, but temporal. Not unchangeable, but changeable. And this is really key to grasp. There are only those two categories. There's no third. There's no um, third thing between the being of God and the being of the creature. Now, let me add one more thing. God is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable as he is living. So when we talk about God, we talk about him as the living and true God. So you've got to understand that as eter infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, he's living and not dead. He's active and not inert. He is characterized by life, uh, not death, uh, by activity and not passivity. Okay, so, so he's infinite, he's eternal, he's unchangeable as living. Now, the creature, in contrast, is finite, um, temporal, and mutable in his life. So there are two distinct kinds of living beings. There is God who in his life is infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. And there's the creature who in his life is finite, temporal, and changeable. Now, there's no there's no third category or third thing. And that is the that is the case forever. That that's never changed. God doesn't change to become the creature in his being. The creature doesn't change to become the creator in his being. Now, why do I put it that way? Well, here's here's what we want to say. Just as we talk about God as infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his life, and the creature as finite, temporal, and changeable in his life, so also in their acts, A-C-T-S, in their actions or activities. So if we ask the question, when God creates the world, when he acts, um, in the work of creation. How do we characterize his actions? They are the actions of an infinite, eternal, unchangeable, living God. Those are his, those are, so if you're asking the question, when God is acting in time, when he's creating the world, what are those actions like? They're the actions of an infinite, eternal, unchangeable, living God. When he creates the world, the world is, is going to be characterized as being finite and mutable and temporal and, and living. And the relationship then between, between those two things is fixed. There's, there's never any modification of that. The creator is who we say he is. The creature is who he says. But, but here's what happens. When those actions of God are described in the Bible, what is the resource by which they're described? From, from what categories does the Bible describe the acts of the infinite, eternal, unchangeable, and living God? Where does it come from? Where are the images and words and categories that describe his actions found? They're found in the world of creation. So anthropomorphism is describing the acts of the infinite, eternal, unchangeable, and living God in the words and concepts 
from the finite, temporal, changeable, living, created order. That's the nature of anthropomorphism. And that's where the mystery always rests. You can't ever change the nature of the mystery. Whatever God is doing, whatever God is saying in history is going to be characterized and described by the words and the ideas and the concepts taken from creation. But those those categories are always temporal, finite, mutable, and they're not the attributes of God. And so in the lecture material, when I am talking to you about Bavink on anthropomorphism, and, and I sent um, Dr. Kim, a um, uh, an essay that I wrote that you guys can read on anthropomorphism. It appeared in the the um, Confessional Presbyterian Journal, uh, and I go into more. I go into a lot more detail in that uh, essay than than what I do in the lecture. And you can read it. I just send it to you to have. It's a word file, and you can have it. And you can send it to anyone you want to. I don't care. It's not like some secret document of mine. Uh, but in, in that essay, um, I, I tried to locate the mystery. What, wh where, where, this is, and this is so key, brothers and sisters. Where is the mystery when we're talking about anthropomorph anthropomorphic language? Defining where that mystery is is absolutely critical. And here's where it is. The categories of time, change, and finitude from the creation are used in the Bible to describe the actions of a God who's neither temporal, limited, or changeable. There is the mystery. That's where it is. Now, so, so, so the, the, the mystery is how language from the creation can properly render the acts of a God who is at no point like the creature. He's infinite, eternal, and changeable as a living God. Now, why do I say that? Why, why is that important? Well, let me see here. I don't know if you're aware of this. The seminary burned these, but th this is a book by a guy named Scott Oliphant. He uh, still teaches at Westminster Seminary. And he says that the best way to understand anthropomorphism is that God, listen, when God relates to creation, he literally becomes temporal. He literally becomes finite. He literally becomes mutable. And he calls these covenantal properties. Now, I don't say any of this in the lecture. This is bonus material. But in God with us, uh, Scott Oliphant says that when God relates to the creature, he becomes literally finite, mutable, and temporal. And let me give you an example. He says that when God is looking for Adam and Eve in the garden, um, and there's a, let me see if I can find the volume. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the uh well i don't see the volume but on uh page 234 of a book entitled reasons for faith and on pages 99 and 100 of the majesty of the mystery another book he wrote pages 99 and 100 here's what he says about god i'm not going to quote it for you i'll just give you the 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 gist he says that in Genesis 3, 9, when God says to Adam, Adam, where are you? When he's, Remember when Adam and Eve have sinned and God is coming to them and he calls out, where are you? Well, it's there that, that Oliphant says, page 234 of, of um, Reasons for Faith, page 99 and 100 of Majesty and Mystery, he says God doesn't know where they are. Why? Because when he relates to creation, 
He takes on new properties that limit him, and he doesn't know the future. I call it the divine ignorance theory. So when when uh, for Oliphant, um, and and by the way, this is no one in the Reformed tradition has ever said this. He's outside of the the Reformed tradition, and in a different tradition called Socinianism or open theism. But he says that um, God doesn't know the future. Why? Because he literally now in relation to the creature is characterized by ignorance, finitude, change, and limitation. So for him, let me locate the mystery for him for for oliphant and for now his views not very widely held most people now even at westminster um uh well at least students a lot of the faculty still believe this but um uh, the students and and a large number of of scholars they reject dr oliphant's view entirely which they should but but for him here's where the mystery is god somehow changes into his opposite when he creates that somehow once he creates he's no longer in his relation to creation infinite but finite he's no longer in his relation to creation eternal but temporal he's no longer in his relation to creation immutable but mutable and he's no longer in his relation to creation he's no longer omniscient but ignorant his his knowledge is growing and developing and so the reason why I spend so much time in that class, in this introductory class, talking to you about anthropomorphism is that if you don't understand that, you're going to do one of two things. If you, if you miss the reform doctrine of anthropomorphism, you're either going to make God into a creature when he reveals himself in time. And and you're going to ascribe attributes to him. In fact, this book, if you look at the subtitle of it, it's called God with us, divine condescension and the attributes of God. And in that book, he's saying that the attributes of God, when he reveals himself to us, are just like the creature, ignorance, lack of power, mutability. So you're if you deny anthropomorphism in the classical reformed tradition like you find in taught in the scriptures taught in uh the westminster confession of faith taught in bovink and van till and voss and others if you deny that either here's the the first option is god is going to be made like the creature in in creation he's going to change or the creature is going to be made like god uh, at some point. Uh, so so th th there's going to be some kind of third thing that God and the creature share in. So I wanted to give you that now because I don't, you brothers and sisters um, are listening in, in those lectures. They, they're a little bit beyond introductory. I'm kind of assuming a lot. And, um, and so while it's an intro to Van Til course, it's probably, I'm probably lecturing closer to a THM level, a PhD level. Um, I don't mean to, I, I've been doing this for a long time and this is all I think about all, all day long. So, you know, it, it's a, it's a little higher level than just an introduction. So what I just did is kind of, and I hope it's helpful. You can tell me if it's not. But what I've tried to do is give you some of the more foundational and basic features about anthropomorphism and what it's designed to safeguard first and where it locates the mystery in the relationship between the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable and living God and the finite, temporal, changeable, and living creature. That, that's where the, 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 um, the, the mystery is.